Welcome back to That Rugby Podcast, brought to you by the Sports Booth. Uh, Hughes, Day. it's been a tough old weekend for you, mates. Has been, has been indeed. It was an enjoyable weekend for me, I must say. Yeah. Uh, kicked off well on a Friday night where my Hurricanes took care of business against your Waratahs. Uh, are you worried? And if you're not worried, when will you start being worried? Uh, look... Not worried because even in the games that we've lost, you look at the, the games that we've lost bar the Rebels game. The, the two, so this, we've lost three games, right? The, yep. the other two games we lost to the Brumbies who are currently undefeated and the Hurricanes who are looking very, very strong this year, right? Yep. We lost to the Rebels as well who haven't looked bad this year either, who have looked like they're a, a, in, a, in contention team. I think uh, it, it depends what you mean by worried. Like you have to be worried about something. Like what is the end result that I'm worried will not happen, Right. If you're saying, am I worried that the Waratahs won't make the top eight? No, I'm not worried about that. I think they will still make the top eight this year. Am I worried that they won't make the top four? Yes, that I would say I'm, I'm worried about. And I think that's that was already a tall order at the start of the year. I think it's just be, become even uh, more of a tall task for the Waratahs. Uh, so I, I think you got to look at it in that context. I, do I still see them playing finals footy this year? Yes, I do. Where Will I start becoming worried that they might not play finals footy is in week eight, they play the force. And if they lose that game, that's the halfway point of the season for them as well. If they lose that game, then I'll be very worried. Realistically, we, we did a bit of a, a, a look uh, into their season. They play the force, then they play the blues, then they play the Highlanders, then they play the Reds, then they play the Rebels, then they play the Dura, then they play the Crusaders, and then they close out with the Moana Pacifica. So, the Blues, the Crusaders will be the tough task in those ones. They should win the rest of those games. Uh, and they, they could take one off either the Blues or the Crusaders. In the upcoming weeks, they've got the Chiefs and they've got the Brumbies again. I think they'll be looking for revenge against the Brumbies. Uh, I would like them to take one of those two. I think we said in the last podcast, they need to win at least one of these three. Um, to Otherwise, you know, your alarm bells probably start ringing. And I'm sort of taking it a step further. It's the, the force for me. Like I could see... You know, if the Chiefs game and the, the Brumbies game are both close, I'm not too worried, but they need to then get a win over the force. Yeah. Like, you know, close games don't get you into the finals at the end of the day. Right, you, I mean, well, actually, they do with bonus yeah. points, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do, but I think if you want to put your hand up for championship contender, yeah. you've got to beat at least one of those teams, you know? Like, you sit there and you go, the Duda at the moment, uh, you know, would rank about where the Waratahs are, but they've got to win over the Crusaders, which is a massive win. I know it was at home. Um, also didn't go too far against uh, away against the Reds. But, yeah, like, you need some of those wins like you had last year. The win against the Crusaders was big for you guys to say that, hey, we can beat these teams if it comes to – if push comes to shove. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. Um, I'm in a much happier position than you are, my friend, um, as a yeah. Hurricane supporter to sit here and only have one loss on the board and be against the Blues. Uh, I cannot complain. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's a bit as well. The, the Waratahs home games against New Zealand teams are against the uh, Highlanders and the Chiefs. Right, but against the Hurricanes, the Blues and the Crusaders, they're all away, which is rough going. Yeah. Which is rough going. Um, you know, I'd much rather play the Highlanders in Dunedin than play the Crusaders in at home. So, yeah, it's it's a rough slate for the Waratahs this year. But look, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to win a championship, you've got to beat all of the teams in the competition. You can't beat, you, you know, you've got to, at the end of the day, you're going to have to, if you're playing wow. in finals, you're playing against the uh, the the best other team in the competition, realistically. So you don't have to be. You can't every be afraid team. of anyone. You don't have. To you can't be afraid team. of everyone. You don't have to beat every team. If we can look back at the 2019 World Cup, where South Africa actually lost to the All Blacks and never beat the All Blacks at that World Cup, I don't want to say that maybe we should be crowned champions with an asterisk next to their name. But all I'm saying you love is a good asterisk. You love. I an asterisk. love an asterisk because I'm just saying. Your favorite comic growing up, Asterix and Obelisk. It's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just. All I can say is, hey, look, there's there's things in life that, you know, you just said it. Normally, to be a champion, you've got to beat everybody. The Springboks didn't beat everyone at the 2019 <laughs> World Cup. It was all I'm saying. It's all I'm yeah. saying. They bet the team that beat us. Yes, they're deserving champions. I just, just a little asterisk, like. Okay, I'm saying. sure. That's all I'm saying. You lose a game in the Rugby World Cup, don't know if you should be current champions. Um, yeah, I mean, 
Mm. Other than <laughs> the Hurricanes uh, obviously winning and your Tars losing again, uh, which made me feel really good inside um, because course. I can come onto this podcast and say that uh, it was a bloody good round and lots of points yeah. scored. I mean, a 90-point thriller with the Brumbies and Moana Pacifica, just about 100 points there in 98. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, defence is an interesting one. Defence is an interesting one in yes. the season. I think the uh, Canes and the how the Tars, the only uh, team under 20 points this round. So uh, I'm interested to see, I guess, this year how... It progresses. Obviously, the new rules in place. We're seeing a lot more tries. I mean, I was getting the updates of that Brumbies Moana Pacifica game where it was just try after try after try after try after yeah. try. Is is it def- lack of defense, or is it going to be actually the attack and the structure of the game is built like this now? Uh, I I think it is sort of the structure of the game is built like this now, and I think it's. I mean, it's a combination of both. I think a little bit of fatigue coming into it as well. I think because as well, we're, remember, we're in the hotter months right now. Like This is a very hot March, yep. right? So I think that is sapping for a lot of these teams. And as we start to get towards the cooler part of the season, the score lines will probably cool down a, a bit as well as the sweat fatigue doesn't play as much of a factor, the loss of hydration and things like that. And it sounds silly, you know. No, uh, no, no, I totally agree with you. I, but, you know, you, you, it, is, it does come into play, I think. Uh, I mean, looking across, across codes at, in the rugby league this week, there was a hot weather warning at the Belmore Sports Ground this week for the Bulldogs-Tigers game where they had to implement, you know, hot weather rules with extra drinks breaks and more trainers allowed on the field to distribute water more evenly because they're worried about player safety and hydration, things like that. And that so that is a factor. And it's, you know, it might sound like we're going into very minute detail about, uh, the competition, but I think that actually genuinely does play uh, a factor, especially in a game like Brumbies Moana Pacifica. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I, I played a game in the soaring heat on Saturday, uh, came out and jumped in for the seconds for an 80 minute stint for them just to end up playing 20 odd minutes for the first after that. I'm too old for a hundred minutes of rugby in a weekend. Mm. I can tell you that, but the, uh, the seconds kicked off at 2 PM. Or two forty five. Stinking hot. And it was just I, I honestly for the first five minutes I was just trying to wipe the sweat out of my eyes rather than catch a ball. And you could tell like when you get caught in those games and in those heat, like you were saying, when you got the ball in your hand, it's great fun. Like you're you yeah. the adrenaline kicks in, you're running. When you're defending, it's probably one of the worst things to do. Everyone's sweaty, you're trying to hold on to guys, you're trying to tackle guys, you're having to k- k- chase back for kicks and stuff like that. It was just a uh probably one of the more miserable temperatures I've ever played in um, as a New Zealander we don't obviously hit the heights of that but it was about 34 yeah. degrees and you're just boiling I actually came on for that last 20 minutes for the first and f- enjoyed that by far a lot more when you, yeah. you you had some shade out there it was now 5 30 just about going on six and you were just like oh this is a temperature this is this is this is what I mean so I couldn't couldn't agree more with you mate the heat plays a part plays a part and then obviously the rule changes things like that but it's made for a more entertaining product that's for sure Uh, and hopefully it means that uh it's allowing the australian new zealand teams and even fiji and the pacific nation teams ahead of the world cup to build on some of their attacking flair for the world cup against some of these uh north european teams you know a team like france who has got a lot of attacking flair in them as well so maybe it's getting these players used to dealing with that on a defensive side, as well as throwing in their own offensive capabilities in there as well. I think where a real challenge will come in will be with the likes of South Africa with a uh, solid defensive, you know, we talk, always talk about South Africa ball, you know, solid defense, pin someone in the, their own half, force a penalty, take three points kind of thing. That's where it might uh, come undone where these teams aren't used to playing that style anymore because they're used to just racking up the points. They're not, used to a 17-9 scoreline anymore. You know, they're looking at 44-25, 62-36, 43-35 kind of thing, yep. you know, where uh, penalties aren't seen as such a big part of the game and it is all about tries. So I think there's def- well, there definitely will be uh, a lot of coaching focusing on studying opponents ahead of this World Cup. Uh, but it's just building my excitement for it, along with the Six Nations is just definitely building my excitement for this World Cup, even though it's going to be at a horrific time for us to view. 
Yeah, it will be. But uh, let's let's run game by game. Obviously, my Canes thirty four beating your Tars seventeen. Uh, yeah. How about that, Max Jorgensen try though? How about that? It was, that was it was it was great. I didn't get to see it live uh, oh. because I was in the hospital actually because I sliced my finger open. Uh. Um, so I the the last thing I saw was the Nadolo try uh, before they stuck something called silver nitrate into my finger and <laughs> uh, burned my wound shut. Uh, and then I stopped caring about the game after that. <laughs> um, so uh, I then did see it later on replay. Amazing. I think he heard himself scoring that scoring try up. though. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but look, three, three tries in his first um, three games or something or like that. Or no, I just, four tries in four games. Yeah, I think four tries in four games. Something he's he's got some record of tries in opening games, kind of thing. Uh, incredible stuff. Yeah, definitely a super stuff for the future. Maybe a sneaky hand for the Wallaby squad later in the year. I wouldn't surprise me if yeah, there's there's some camps going around during the season that he's involved, even though he may not make that final squad. Uh, he's involved, but a player who might be involved and might heavily be involved, Langy Gleason, put his yes. foot forward again, had another massive game, especially coming up against. The best player in the world, Artie Sarvia, um, who you know didn't didn't do a lot, but um, Langy Eason looked fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think uh, Australia's be, be got some. Australia's got some good number eight options. I tell you what, heading into this World Cup, and we'll talk about one of them in the last game of the uh, last game of the round with Harry Wilson. But yeah, Langy Gleason definitely putting his name up to to be part of that Wallaby squad. Um, the 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 Waratahs. They had a big shift this week. Ben Donaldson to 10, Tane Edmed uh, on the bench, and then Jorgensen uh, back to 15, just to try and shift things around, get things going. I, I'm just, I don't know what's going on with the Waratahs at the moment. Like the talents there, it's just not quite coming together. I, th- I think it is just these young players. Like you look at the the sort of key pieces, the the 10, Donaldson and Edmed, they're both very young. Jorgensen, very young as well. Just trying to get that sort of spine a bit more cohesive. And then you got Jake Gordon, who's yeah experienced, but he you know he's he's changed his ten um, from last week to this week. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's just a bit of uh, assembly still required. It's a bit of IKEA furniture at the moment uh, with the Waratahs, and just need to uh, build themselves into a Malmoa uh, bench or couch <laughs> or something like that. Haven't quite. They've gone a couple of steps too far and realised they actually weren't meant to screw it all the way in and now have to go yeah. back a couple of steps. To go back. Realised they've used the wrong screw with the tapered end when they're supposed to use the screw with the flat end. And exactly, it's just, yeah. yes. That's, yep. that's what's happening. Okay, interesting. We'll see how the TARS, if they can reverse it back up and, and, and get it all going as the IKEA furniture. The Chiefs yeah. carried on their undefeated start, 44 to 25 by the Rubles. I was quite impressed by the Rubles again. 19 points, you know, does it seems like a big loss, but against... Uh, Hot Chiefs outfit in Hamilton. Um, to score 25 points, I still think that's pretty impressive from the Rebels, and I think they'll take a lot from those games. Again, like yeah. you said, losing doesn't win you championships, but there's a difference being beaten 40 to 5, 60 to 10 versus uh, 40 to 25 type scoreline. So I was, I was uh, slightly impressed. Then the game mm. of the round. I don't know if you saw. Yeah. The Blues versus the Crusaders, but gosh, they could just about play that every week, and I would be a yeah. pretty happy man. I, I I saw some highlights of the game, and I saw a lot of social media attention on this game. Uh, referee Gate being thrown out there once more, <laughs> and uh, look another another game where the the referees seem to be the focal point, which is never pleasant to see. Yeah, it's not. I I tend to agree with all the referees, most of the referees' decisions in that game. Um, mm specifically around the cards. I just, there was a lot going on, a lot to handle. Um, but again, the Crusaders go into Eden Park and come away with a win. It doesn't matter how you get it done as long as you get it done. Um, yeah. So this is, I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're, you know, halfway through this round uh, uh, discussing it, and it's legitimately Crusaders lose to the doodle last week, come back and beat the Blues, who uh, beat the Hurricanes the week before that. So I don't think any team's susceptible to a loss this year. Like... Brumbies, in my and Pacifica pushed Brumbies for 60-odd minutes as we move on to that game. 62-36 yeah. for Brumbies. But it was 36-34 at one point. You know, obviously, I think the class of the Brumbies shine through. Um, but the Mayan Pacifica, again, fighting there again. Yeah, they're, they are an interesting team, Mayan and Pacific. I don't quite know what to make of them. Like, it, it's similar to 
sort of the conundrum we had about the Highlanders, about, you know, this, this, the Moana Pacifica haven't won a game yet, right? But they lost by uh, two points to Fiji in round one. Then they ran into the buzzsaw of the Chiefs, but have lost, but lost by a similar margin to what the the Rebels did to the Chiefs, right? Um, and put up arguably a better showing against them than the Highlanders did. Uh, they lost to the Force by three points. Again, another narrow loss. And then they have this incredible fight against the Brumbies. And yes, they haven't won any games. They're at the bottom of the table, but you just feel like this doesn't feel like a bottom team. Like this doesn't feel like the worst team in the competition. And that's, I think that's actually the sign of a really good competition where somebody's got to come last, but it doesn't feel like anybody's last. You know, I guess in a lot of competitions, you will have that minnow who is like, okay, well, this is the year that this team just does fuck all right. Yeah. And is not going to um, call, you know, might have a win here or there, uh, but you know, it's really not going to, uh, trouble anyone in any of their other games. And this is clearly the worst team. Um, I don't think you have that this year. You know, you look at the the bottom four teams, the Waratahs, the Rebels, the Highlanders, and Moana Pacifica, right? Three wins amongst four teams there. But I don't think you, you'd struggle just... The Highlanders is the only team that's really been super blown out in any of their yep. games of those oh, of those four. Force. Took a seventy-one twenty. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't list the force oh, in my okay. four there. Okay, in, yeah, I was talking about the bottom four because force are just above that. Force are actually in the top eight at the moment. So, but of the Waratahs, Rebels, Highlanders, and Moana Pacifica, Highlanders the only one in that four that have well, got received a real shellacking. You know, yeah. no, um, definitely. Yeah. So I think it's it's a, actually signs of a closer competition, which is getting more people interested. And look, I, I feel like this is a year of rugby this year, rugby union and league. We're seeing more people back in stadiums for both codes, probably more so rugby league than union at the moment, but union has got the boost of a world cup this year yeah. uh, as well. You know, the Eddie Jones news and things like that. So I feel like this is a, this is a rugby centric year um, across uh, Australia and New Zealand. So, uh, and the Pacific nations as well now. So I, I feel like there's a, just a step up in the quality of these teams. I, I know there was a worry, you know, adding these two new teams, Fiji and Dura and Moana Pacifica, much like expansion in any sport. Is this, is there going to be a dilution of talent? Is this going to make the competition weaker? I don't think we've seen that. I think if anything, the competition has been strengthened. I agree, especially with the Dura. Um, I think they're, yeah. they, we could have done this 10 years ago with the Dura and brought a Fijian team and um, that's how fantastic they've been. And I think, yeah, Moana Pacifica are a few wins around a corner. Um, of turning it up and turning uh, turning on the lights there, I guess. I am a slightly worried with the crowds. Like, there wasn't a good turnout in the Canes versus the Waratahs game. Now, to be honest, it was a typical Wellington day with the winds, mm. and it actually was a great neutraliser, I thought, because you just couldn't... Line-outs were struggles, you know, kicks were... It mm. was just... Uh, I love a good windy game, but not, not many crowds. Same with the Highlanders' force. It seems like, you know... Teams really get behind the rivalry games, the the interpersonal yeah. games. Um, and then, like, you know, Highlanders Force that was played in Invercargill wasn't seen as such a, a big game. Obviously, the Highlanders struggling force aren't doing great either, but still it was a little mm. bit disappointing to see a lack of fans. Um, mm. And you kind of sit there and you go, how do we improve on that? Like, like you said, it's a rugby-centric year. We've got a Rugby World Cup. Eddie Jones is bringing it up. And these are I mean, entertaining games as well. Like you're getting your money's worth by going to one of these games. Exactly. Like, you know, 43, 35, I watched some of that Highlanders force game and it took about 30 minutes for them to get into the game. But once they did yeah. both kicking for sideline, not taking the points, scoring good tries, it was an exciting game in the end. And I just sat there and I went, man, there's just, yeah, like we need to obviously find a way to get more people to the grounds because that is what will keep the sport alive. Now, I think yep. internationally we won't have a problem with that this year, but Super Rugby has left me disappointed again. I And again, I'm a, I'm a big fan of smaller crowds, but if you look at Invercargill where they played that Highlanders Force game, it's a small ground already. It's it's I would be surprised if it carried 10,000 people and it wasn't full. So uh, I just I sat there and I went, mm, something's... I know Highlanders aren't having a great year, haven't had a great start, first one of the season, but something's not sitting right there with sales, with filling the stadiums. You know, Eddie Jones made a big push for it, and it still hasn't quite hit home yet. And I don't, I, I don't have the answers. It's the first time I, I think we've tried our answers with, 
you know, changing this comp a little bit, you mm. know, having the Australian Super Rugby and the New Zealand Super Rugby split and then coming together, something like that. But I'm not, I'm just not sure what, where, the, where the answers lie. Yeah, I think it's, you know, as you said, the, the people are getting behind the rivalry games. Um, yeah, because I, I guess it takes two to tango uh, in Super Rugby. Like you need both your fans and the opposing fans to make it a decent crowd for Super Rugby. You know, unlike some other sports like American football, say, where the crowd will be filled just by home supporters for a lot of teams. But even in a sport like American football, they're struggling to fill some of their stadiums for some of their struggling teams as well. So I think it's a, it's a universal sport problem, bar maybe soccer, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but again, those are smaller grounds and a, a lot of football stuff like in like the EPL, like you think about England, how easy it is to get across England and how easy it is to get to those stadiums and things like that. I, I think that's also something we've got to recognize is how geographically spread out the super rugby competition is, you know, um, even if you take the Western force out of it, like the spread of the teams around is just absolutely huge between Australia and New Zealand. Even if you only took the East coast Australian teams, there's a huge dif- distance between uh, Brisbane and, and Melbourne, you know? So totally. I, I think you have to recognize that it is sometimes hard to, to travel to the, to these games. Uh, look, I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is. I think the, uh, the, the answer is uh, probably maybe at an international level is you see, we start seeing the Wallabies make some moves. Um, then the Australian fans will start showing up a bit more. I don't really know what you can do in New Zealand, to be honest. I don't know what the, the, crowd the what the sort of uh socio this social state is in new zealand for why these people aren't coming to the games in australia i think you can sort of point to well the wallabies have been disappointing for a few years now so people aren't that interested in the super rugby teams because the national team isn't doing that well we don't have those superstars to to point to like one of the biggest draws for when i went to a lot more super rugby games was the superstar in Israel Folau, where you knew that every game he was going to pull something out. I don't think Australian rugby has one of those at the moment. Yeah. Max Jorgensen might be the next one. He might be the one that sort of, um, that is a legitimate superstar that will get people talking. But uh, I think Folau had the benefit of being such a cross code player that he drew in people from those other codes as well. I, I really don't have, have the answer for, for what Super Rugby can do to, to bring in more crowds. I wish I did, and I'm sure Super Rugby wish they did as well. Yeah, it's tough. Like I'm trying to see if I can find an actual figure for that Hurricanes-Waratahs game because mm. I would imagine it was less than 10,000, um, which in a 33,000 stadium, 36,000 stadium, isn't a good look when you've got less mm. than, a, you know, probably a quarter full, um, and it's a terrible stadium to start off with. So I just sit there and I go... Yeah, don't have the answers, but maybe we'll chuck some ideas out there, spitball mm. something, see what we can come up with. Um, last game of the round was the Reds versus the Duda. The Reds holding on <coughs> to man- yeah. to beat the Duda 27-24. Uh, I was disappointed to start off with, uh, but I like the fight back from the Duda. Just about stole it at the end, had the chance. Again, in this competition, to be great, to be one of, considered one of the good teams, you've got to win yeah. back to back to back. Unless you're playing really good teams, which... Look at the Blues who have played, you know, in the past three weeks, Brumbies, Hurricanes, Crusaders. Three really hard games coming away, one from two. You can live with that. The Dura, I think if they wanted to make a statement to go Crusaders and then Reds away would have been a huge statement to, to yeah. make. Um, but, I, again, another fantastic game, another competitive game, and that's all we can ask for at the moment. Yeah, and Harry Wilson uh, put his hand up in this game to for Wallaby's um, selection, I think, as well, and it's going to give... Uh, Eddie Jones, a bit of a head scratcher between himself and Lange Gleeson about who his starting number eight is going to be. I think they've both got um, very positive attributes about them. And, uh, you know, I think Wilson's had a had a rough go of it under Dave Rennie um, and maybe wasn't given the, the chances that he deserved. Uh, and, but he's certainly putting his hand up now to, to be a Wallaby. I'm going to slightly disagree with you. Now, mm. I think he was given chances. I think... He hasn't taken that step up yet for international rugby. He's been great at Super Rugby before. I think he's in the mm. form of his life, like playing the best footy Harry Wilson can play, which is great. I think it'll be really interesting what direction Eddie Jones heads in with this team. 
Now, yeah. when he had, obviously, England, he had Courtney Laws at six. So will Bobby Valentini go to eight? And then, you know, that makes it near impossible for any of those other guys to start if you start Bobby Valentini at eight. Because, again, he's by far, the, I, I would argue, one of the top Australian rugby players. Now, he's playing at six for the Brumbies, I believe. Yeah, because then mm. Pete Samu's at eight. Um and I prefer Valentini at six, but if he goes down that idea of a tall six, a Jed Holloway type six line out option, um, which a lot of teams are doing now, you see the All Blacks sometimes starting Scott Barrett at six. It'll be really interesting. I, 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 mm. I, I'm fascinated. That'll be my, I think when, you know, we've got like 70 odd days until the next international, 80 odd days until international rugby rolls around again. Um, and Australia's and Eddie Jones' first team is going to be the talk of the town when that comes around. Yeah, 100%. Um and you know that'll be great for uh, for the sport in general in Australia is to get some of that in the news. And I think yeah, the whole watch on it, who's going to be in Eddie's team has already generated a bit of social media buzz. So hopefully we see that tra- reflected in the traditional media as well. Totally. Uh, shall we move on to the Six Nations, my friend? Okay. Let's. Well, let's start by giving Luke a big round of applause. He predicted it. He predicted it. Maybe the easiest prediction out there was an yeah. Irish Grand Slam. Now, I said it. Why did I say it? They were playing France at home. They were playing England at home, who I thought were the two hardest teams in this competition. They took care of business. Uh, Irish Grand Slam, congratulations. Uh, I think people were still criminally underrating them. Yeah. Um, I think they deli- – everyone's going to say it because they've failed at World Cup time after time, but they have never looked better – Four-pack looks incredible. I think could rival Springboks, could rival any team out there. Um, so I think the Irish are looking fantastic heading into the World Cup. Now, I just quickly, before I let you take the floor, I've got two more points, and you can talk about your Six Nation points. France impressed me um, with just that one win, which is unfortunate. So France impressed me because of one game. Like, they lost their big, their big game was the Irish game where they had to win that to prove that they were number one team. They're not. Every other game, they didn't impress me. Wales put up a fight and haven't put up a fight against many teams. Italy just about bet France. Scotland went to France and put up a fight. France didn't look good. France, at the moment, Laurel's rest off that 53-10 drumming they put on England. So I'm still Mm. not on the French bandwagon. I'm not as far off as I was Three Six Nations because they finished second. I predicted them to finish fourth. However, going on to my next point, their win over England and this English team who have, uh, I'm going to say, had a disaster of Six Nations. And yep. it's for that 53 10 game again. If you take out, say they were competitive in that game, it's not the end of the world to finish fourth. Uh, that you know the, the losses they had are all competitive games. Now you look at that and you go, that was a really bad loss. They didn't look like beating Ireland. Obviously, red card. Um, I don't know. Those who say what it is out there, Freddie Stewart's red card, I agree with it because of the laws currently for a rugby person. I don't agree with it, but mm. yeah. Um, and then the loss against Scotland. I mean, you predicted them to win. We already kind of gave you enough shit about that last week. But yeah, to finish fourth, they'll be disappointed. Uh, I think, yeah, they will be. I'm disappointed uh, in them. I think... They needed to perform better in the Six Nations to uh, step out of the shadow of the Eddie Jones decision, and they haven't done that at all. If anything, they've deepened the shadow. They've made they've put further scrutiny on uh, the players, on the decision makers uh, in English rugby because uh, you know you had a coach that took you to a World Cup final, um, and you've moved on, and you haven't. It doesn't look like, you know, all the points everyone was talking about, Eddie Jones, about this England team, doesn't look like much has changed. Doesn't look like much has changed. So now if you're thinking, all right, the coach wasn't the problem, where's the problem? That's when you start getting some division in the locker room, division in the higher-ups. You know, players aren't feeling secure uh, in their spot. Uh, They're not feeling maybe supported. And, you know, I think that it can lead to a perhaps a very disastrous World Cup for, for England um, if this Six Nations is, is anything to go by. Look, the the I, I did I did think that they would lose to Scotland. I thought that maybe the first game wouldn't be would be too quick, too soon to uh, for them to fully implement some of the changes they wanted to put in. And even though they lost to Scotland, it was a close loss. You're like, okay, look, 
you know, they might, they, they've got some potential here. You know, they, they lost sure, but there was, there was something there. Uh, they, they beat Italy. They beat Wales. You're like, okay, this is the expected ones. This is the next two weeks that are really going to show us what this English team is made of. And then to just fully capitulate against France, show some spirit against Ireland, but really just be completely outclassed. You're like, okay, well, this is now sort of, you look at your, sort of top four teams in the world, Ireland, France, New Zealand, South Africa, you can see that England is a step behind those teams. And you could argue even a step behind Scotland as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. I think it's really interesting. And, I, you know, I don't know if you've seen Clive Woodward's um, rubbish that he spits out, but he uh, pretty much said, you know, that demolition against Steve Borthwick's fault, it's Eddie Jones's fault, and, and he's had some very harsh things to say of Eddie Jones. But I'm like, he goes, it clearly showed that, you know, his wins were band-aided over a much deeper problem that he had. And I went, the most successful coach in English history. Yeah. And you're saying his, like, couple wins band-aided? Like, shut the f, if up. If anything, like. <laughs> if anything, that's a compliment to Eddie as a coach. Like, if he's had these deeper issues he's had to deal with and he's managed to pull out wins, and not only wins, but have the most successful coach in English history, as you said, that's a pretty pretty bloody good testament as a coach. That's uh, that's when I was like, okay, you've stopped being a pundit and you just have taken it to another personal level where you weren't happy with Eddie Jones, the person, even if it's an Australian coach, and you're, like I said, a New Zealand mm. coaching, uh, Australian coach in New Zealand, he's obviously done the same thing where it's gone, it's personal. And I just think it lacks a little bit of respect in the game of rugby, which we, yeah. we follow, you know, like... For all of what Australia and everything that happened to Dave Rennie, no one came out and said, you know, now that the Aussies have lost, and again, they haven't lost, but say they lose by 40-odd points, I don't think anyone's going to be going in Australian rugby, that was Dave Rennie's fault. You know, yeah. that's, this is where I think the English problem lies. I go, yeah. you know, and it, to be fair, I think it's probably a New Zealand problem as well. Let's say we go on, World Cup, Ian Foster's gone, and then six months later, go and lose the bladder. So I think New Zealanders will blame Ian Foster. New Zealanders and English are yeah. more like I think your Aussies have understood rugby in a different perspective. I think the expectations for the English and the All Blacks are, are so high that it's like anyone, anything that goes wrong, we can we just have to blame anyone else, bar ourselves, basically. Yeah, which hundred percent I think is wrong. Yes. 100%. I think that's uh, that's very correct. I mean, yeah, it, it's almost South African in nature, but mm -hmm. except you guys sort of target uh, previous people in your organization, whereas the South Africans target the ref. So <laughs> it's just a yeah matter of target selection there. Yeah, I definitely agree with what you said there. Um, I think, yeah, Aussies are more likely to, uh, to blame the current coach um, than the previous one. You know, when Dave Rennie didn't have huge success, we didn't go blame Michael Checker yep. uh, for for Rennie's. But we gave, I think, we gave Rennie a bit of extra breathing room because of the disastrous reign of Rugby Australia in the years leading up to Rennie's appointment. So I think yep. he was probably given a little bit of extra time because of that. But uh, at the end of the day, his tenure was what it was. He was moved on from, and that was it. And that's the key phrase: he was moved on from. Moved on. We have moved on. It it's no longer relevant about Dave Rennie, right? Because, you know, for my mind, what has Eddie Jones got to do with this current England team? You know, Borthwick's taken over. He said a chance to put in a little bit of his structure and things. Yeah. Like, you know, he's probably not going to, you know, completely renovate the house, so to speak, but it's not going to be, he's not, it's not as if he's inherited a paper book and says Eddie's playbook for England rugby <laughs> version two or whatever, you know, it's not like, it's not like he's just taken Eddie Jones' book. Like, oh man, I've got so little time. Better just do everything Eddie did. No, he's got he's 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 a coach himself, right? And the Six Nations runs over a period of a month and a half, right? So even within the time of the Six Nations, he can be putting in stuff into place. He can be making those uh, personnel decisions and things like that as well. So I think it's a bit of, as you rightly point out, scapegoating to to look at uh, the previous coach rather than sit looking at the current coach and saying you know examining what they're doing. Totally. Totally, totally, totally fucking English being scapegoats. Here we go. Um, <laughs> I did want to just quickly mention, I saw a news article about the uh, potential women's British and Irish Lions tour, and I thought that was a fascinating idea because, and, and a lot was against the idea just purely because of how strong that British and Irish team would be, that they would decimate yeah. teams 
not on an international scale. Like when you see a British and Irish Lions men's team and they play against, you know, a Waratahs or a Brumbies or a Reds, as we will see uh, in the 2025 yeah. tour, they, th- this women's team, even as deep as they will go, they'll probably defeat. But I still thought, like, that's that's part of the growing pains that every other team's going to have. Yeah. You, I guarantee one of those games on a British and Irish women's Lions tour will be an upset. So you'll say, let's say, again, it's not yeah. the 20 foot 25. Let's say they go... Uh, 2027 and do every year in between, whatever, it doesn't matter, and say they come to New Zealand, I imagine one of the New Zealand Super Rugby women's team will beat a mid-week side against a British and Irish woman, woman somewhere along you, the what line. I would, I would love to see the Fijiana Druana against the British and Irish line. Exactly. Like Last that year's would be Super Rugby women's champions who were yeah um, astounding. Um, I'd love to see those... Uh, two teams go at it. I think it would be a great uh, draw for crowds for rugby, especially in women's rugby. Which you need those events like that. Like we we know how important mm. the men's British and Irish Lions tour is. I can't see it not working, in my opinion. So I just thought that was yeah. a, a good little piece to add on. Uh, we are going to finish today. We're going to do this over two podcasts. So I am up first, but I saw this and took this idea from the Breakdown Lads who have a podcast, um, and I saw this on TikTok. And I went, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do mm. it. So thanks, lads. But we are naming our 10 best players ever. So from 10 to 1, I'm going to go today. Um, I'm going to hit you with the name, give you a quick reason, and then we'll do a full breakdown in a post-podcast chat. Uh, mm. So we can break down exactly why I put these players where, but for now I'll just give you a quick, brief little reason of what who I selected and why. Um, so I've started off with some honourable mentions as my asterisks. I love a good asterisk, as we know. Yeah, um, as we know. So I've got three players, and I've got Habana, obviously Brian Habana from uh, South Africa, the Springboks. I've got two wingers on my list, I think. Yes, and. I couldn't put him over any of those two wingers, and as I went down my list, he just fell off it. So he's close. Jerome Kaino, another one. Uh, I put him, and the reason he's an honourable mention, I put him over Kieran Reid. I think he's actually a better player than Kieran Reid. Um, and so he was just unlucky to miss out over the 9 and 10, who are both loose forwards. And then I've got Bowden Barrett. Now, um, he's the only multiple player of the year award winner not on this list, and I think it's because his career hasn't ended. When his career ends, let's say 2023 World Cup, he goes to another World Cup, wins the World Cup with the All Blacks, is quite a big part of it. This list may have to change, I think. I think Bowden Barrett eventually ends up on this list, is what I'm basically saying. However, starting in 10, I've gone Sergio Paris, obviously the Italian number eight, big ball guy, you would recognise him, was influential in getting Italy to a tier one nation. In number nine, I've got Mamuka Gogodze, uh, the Georgian number eight, uh, another, again, player who lifted a nation to another level, and that's why I've selected those two. Uh, they both played, like, around 100 caps for their country. Uh, it was just incredible, both of them in the same position, leading their nation. In eight, I've gone Johnny Wilkinson, first five from England. We know his ability. We know his... Um, his meaning to the sport, his success, the drop goal in 2003. In seven, my first and only Aussie, David Campisi. Uh, I just think you can't leave him out. I think he's the – it was between, like, I went him and John Eels. I really like what John Eels did. Mm. I just think David Campisi was Australian rugby, the golden boy as I saw it. In six, I – I decided, and I, I said this when I made my, my Mount Everest or what is it, um, my Mount Rushmore, Rushmore. Uh, oh. Mount Rushmore, I said I needed a South African and I took Victor Matfield. This time I've gone with Oz Durant, I think. A two-time World Cup winner in 95 and 2007. The longevity, a front row forward, the only front row forward I've selected on here. He was the pinnacle of front row, so that's why I went with him. In five, and maybe mm. a lot of people will probably disagree with this one, but I've gone Jonah Lomu, and they'll disagree because he's probably lower than what people thought, but I just think Jonah Lomu yeah. changed the game, incredible player. In four, I think the best player 
to come out of Wales ever, Gareth Edwards, the little scrum half. I, yeah, I, again, I, obviously we're the younger generation, but when you look back and watch what he did and hear the stories about him, incredible. In free, Ryan O'Driscoll, bold. I couldn't think of anyone to go higher than him in the Northern Hemisphere. Quite clearly yeah. the best player. Um, in two and one, we've obviously got two players left, Richie McCaw and Dan Carter. Now, how I decided who went first and second was really tough. I've gone Richie McCaw two. I think if you're talking about the best player ever, I think the best player to ever touch the field is Dan Carter. What he could do on a rugby field, I think Richie McCaw, and this, you got the same argument, you know, like Messi versus Ronaldo. Richie McCaw was all effort, all, you know, got himself to where he had to be just by himself. Uh, a very Ronaldo-like player, whereas Dan Carter's like Messi. It was just, he had the natural talent to be a first five, just mm. absolutely gifted. So that's my top ten. Quickly to run for it, for it again, Sergio Paris, Mamuka Gorgodze, Johnny Wilkinson, David Campisi, Oz Durant, John Alomu, Gareth Edwards, Brian O'Driscoll, Richie McCaw, and Dan Carter. Hell of a list. Hell of a list. I think you'll definitely generate some discussion on that one. I think I will, but I am doubly as interested now for your list next week um, because I think we have quite mm. different taste in rugby player. It's quite obvious. Yeah. You know, you like the flamboyant, moustache-wearing, mullet-having number seven, whereas I like the bruising, cutthroat, big lad number eight. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see who you pick. If you want to hear... You, you've got more, almost more of a foretaste, and I've got more of a back taste, which is a very weird thing for... <laughs> That's because... Considering you, you, considering you, dream you played of first five, I played front row. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I, you dream of being a back. I know what I can do as a back, and I know what I can't do, yeah. and what Adi Sevilla can do, I can't do. <laughs> yeah. I live out my, my fantasy every Sunday morning on the touch rugby field, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, we'll break down all of these... Top 10 that are in another video in our post podcast chats. So make sure you don't go onto our YouTube video to hear about that as Husey really mm. digs a knife in on any decisions he doesn't like or does like. And I explain mine away. Other than that, bloody good week in rugby. No international rugby for a good yes. 80 odd days. Uh, but Super Rugby will keep us alive and well. Mm. Yes. And uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. But we have got an upcoming live cast, you and I. We do. Uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after. It is. Is it a week? It's not a. Yeah, it is a weekend. April a Saturday. Fools, Saturday night. Yep. Saturday Rumble night. Is, it's not an Boratars. April Fool's joke. It is not an <laughs> April Fool's joke. But we will be live commentating the Brumbies and the Waratahs, much as we did with the Hurricanes and uh, Waratahs last year. Uh, what is going to be interesting for me this year is that. Uh, it's we're not on opposing sides Side, this yep. time, you know. It's a, it is just we're just going to be purely going for the Waratahs. I'm sure, Luke, uh, you will definitely be supporting me in barracking for the Waratahs in that game. You know what's funny? You know what is funny? Mm. I have a and I think most New Zealanders a passionate hate for the Brumbies because a they were like considered the best Aussie team, obviously the first to win Super Rugby and stuff. They also had all the hated players of the George Gregg and George Smith, Stephen Larkham, that you just mm. enjoyed hating. So I've never really hated the Tars, obviously in 2014, when you win, when you're a winner, everyone starts to mm -hmm. hate you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have a distaste for the Brumbies, I must say. So I, I don't know, I'll go in there as I a neutral. I think you've got an interest in seeing the... what. You've got, the, you've got an interest in seeing the Brumbies fall as well because you're right behind them on the table. Exactly. So, I mean, I'll go in there with, you know, a, an open mind, but I may be swayed depending on what happens. If I see Charlie Gamble getting a runaway and that slick mullet with the moustache flowing in the wind, I may be turned. May not be able to stop yeah. me. Yeah, look, we've... More than one of us has been turned by that mullet. So, uh, <laughs> and we wouldn't be the first, mate. Um, so, yes, look out for that as well on our socials pages and things like that. Um, sure to be an entertaining night as it was last time. Definitely. All righty. Thank you for joining us. This has been that Rugby Podcast by the Sports Booth. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Peace.